it's good to see everybody. Uh, we want to welcome you all to today's presentation. It's uh, Competitive Advantages, Intellectual Property Basics for Advising Business Clients. I'm Peter Nyes, your LCBA member at large and host for today's presentation. Uh, this is the first presentation by the LCBA's new Intellectual Property Practice Law section, uh, chaired coincidentally by today's speakers, uh, Mark Needs and, and Luca Hickman. Um, we invite you all to join this section or any other of our great practice law sections, which now incredibly we have 12 active practice sections. So, so real exciting. Uh, before we get started today, we have a couple quick items we'd like to address. Um, first, the LCB annual membership renewals are starting. Um, the LCBA offers so many great professional networking opportunities, continuing legal, legal education presentations, community outreach events like our moot court and mock trial competitions and our Constitutional Law Week, where we go and teach uh, seventh graders about the Constitution. We hope that those of you watching today not only renew your membership, but spread the word to your friends uh, and tell them all the great things that we're doing and, and why it would be great for them to join us. It's also a reminder uh, of the LCBA's Executive Council election is currently going. You thought the election was over? Well, you're wrong. But our ballots are due by this Monday. So uh, we have a fantastic slate of candidates and we encourage you to get your ballots in prior to Monday. Um, you know, 2021 is coming right around the corner and uh, we always look for great annual sponsors. And so there are sponsorship opportunities. If you know of any businesses that would like to sponsor, please reach out to our fantastic executive director, Lauren Baugh. We'd like to take a quick shout out for our 2020 annual sponsors who supported us. Uh, so well over this last year uh, that we just can't thank them enough. It's uh, the Keeler Law Firm, Sanibel Captiva Community Bank, Edison National Bank, our friends at Henderson Franklin, John Webb Legal Group, Gray Robinson, Bank OZK, Dennis L. Webb PA, Boyd Leonard Anderson PA, The Fort Myers Court Reporting, Copy Lady, Boyd Agnew and Patonovic, U.S. Legal Support, Conrick PR and Marketing, Michael M. Raines, PA, and Aloya Roland, Attorneys at Law. We also want to let everybody know that's attending today that one hour of CLE has been uh, approved, and we will circulate that out after the meeting. This presentation is also being recorded, and it will be uh, a viewable very soon on YouTube, and you can find that on our Lee County Bars webpage. Lastly, we'll take questions at the end. Everyone knows the Zoom routine. Please keep your uh, microphones uh, muted during the presentation. There is a chat box should you want to add questions. Without further ado, it's my honor to introduce our two guest speakers today, Mark Needs and Luca Hickman. Mark is the chair of the Intellectual Property Group at Henderson Franklin and concentrates his practice on trademarks, copyright, trade secret protection, franchising, privacy, and data protection matters. Mark is also counsels clients on data protection and data breach response matters, and is a frequent blogger, I don't know if a lot of you know that, on the copyright, patent, and trademark uh, laws uh, blog run by Henderson Franklin. I encourage you to check out that blog, it's got great stuff. Um, Mark's a former Chicago native, um, and he received his uh, BA from Miami University, his JD from Chicago Kent College of Law, and is barred in both Illinois and Florida. As I mentioned earlier, Mark is the co-chair of the LCBA's IP practice law section. Luca Hickman is a registered patent attorney and associate attorney at Henderson Franklin. Luca works with clients and startups with intellectual property license agreements, negotiates and counsels on IP contracts, creates end user license agreements for software companies and uh, is specializes in anti-infringement matters to name just a few of his practice focuses. Interestingly, um, Luca is a trained electrical engineer and he received his BS at the Milwaukee School of Engineering and his Diplome Engineer at Lübeck University in Germany. And he got his JD at Ave Marie Law School. Luca is admitted to the US Patent and Trademark Offices, Supreme, US Supreme Court, US uh, Appeals Court for the 11th Circuit. He's also uh, admitted to the US District Courts for the Northern, Middle and, and Southern uh, Florida and so many other things. Please uh, join me in welcoming our speakers today. Thank you. Well, thanks, Peter. Uh, we're, we're really happy to be here and uh, hopefully you guys will uh, learn a few things from us. We're uh, going to be talking about uh, intellectual property, obviously, and we're giving it in sort of the vein of, you know, what is important to businesses because uh, so many of us work with business clients. It's good to know what some of the things are that 
um, that our clients and businesses out there feel are important uh, in terms of intellectual uh, property assets. Um, see if I can. Does that work? Did, did that share? Yes. Okay. So uh, we're, like I said, we're here to talk about the different uh, intellectual property concepts and just give a very basic overview. Luca and I are going to sort of tag team things because, you know, as any good uh, law firm would, you want to try and uh, you want to try and staff it accordingly. And Luca definitely has some uh, some expertise that I don't. So. We're going to just kick off and, and, and think about what intellectual property is. You know, um, intellectual property uh, it relates to ideas and creativity, but uh, at the most basic level, ideas can't be owned. Nobody can own the idea outright of a thing um, or a story or an image. However, you can protect your own manifestation of that idea, what you uh, have created. Um, you can protect what you put into tangible medium, you know, whether that's a sculpture or a film or, uh, or a, uh, a, a, a recording, anything tangible um, that represents uh, creativity can be protected at one level or another by intellectual property laws. IP law falls into what I call the four food groups. There are four main types of IP protection and uh, we've heard of them all. They all protect different things, um, but uh, generally speaking, um, they cover the uh, in, intangible uh, side of various business assets, like you know, trademarks cover uh, names uh, of businesses or names of products, copyright. Um, you know, when we think of copyright, of course, we think of things like books and films. Uh, patent law protects uh, inventions and uh, processes, um, and trade secret law is sort of a catch-all uh, that protects the, the things that are inside your business that give you the competitive advantage, and that leads to the title of our presentation. So we're going to run through these uh, kind of quickly. Each of these could easily be their own one-hour CLE, so we're going to kind of sort of fly through this thing and give a 30,000-foot overview. Um, quite literally. So we're going to start with trademarks. And, you know, you look at this and you're like, what the heck are cows doing uh, on, uh, in a CLE? Well, if you look at the cows, you see they're branded. And that's why everybody talks about branding. It relates back to the good old days when the, uh, when the, the, the ranchers would put their mark on their cattle so they knew which one was theirs and other ranchers knew which cow belonged to which rancher and where it ended up. Trademark law, branding, is the same kind of thing. It is a mark, a designation on a product or a service. It's a word, name, or symbol that identifies the source and origin or the owner of that product or service. Just like a brand on a cow represents which rancher owned the cow, the brand or the trademark on a product represents who the product comes from. And the purpose behind trademark law is really to convent, prevent consumer confusion. You don't want trademarks to be so similar that a consumer is going to be confused as to what source it emanates from, whether something is coming, you know, is made by company A or company B. You, need to, the, you don't want the consumer confused as to what they're getting or who they're getting it from. It's not like some other aspects of intellectual property. It's not purely exclusionary because it doesn't prevent other people from doing the same thing as you, only they can't use a same uh, uh, or too similar of a trademark to identify it. So, of course, you've got Pepsi and you've got Coca-Cola. They're the same basic type of product, but they both have different trademarks to identify them, and that's the key um, in that sense. You can have multiple people doing the same thing, but the, the names have to be a little bit different. Trademarks 
can take many different forms and, and you know, they fall mostly into the idea of you know, words, images, or combinations of those. And if you look at the, the, what we've got here on these images, you see the, you know, the Play-Doh, uh, the, the fanciful uh, print of the word Play-Doh, or you see the Owens Corning logo. You know, those incorporate words and in the images, but trademarks can also uh, represent other things such as a sound. The sound of the lion at the beginning of the MGM movies is a registered trademark, just like the NBC chimes is a registered trademark. Colors can be a trademark, like pink for fiberglass insulation. You know, when people see pink, they know it comes from Owens Corning. And the strangest one of all uh, is the smell of Play-Doh. Um, it's a you know it's a great childhood memory, but I had no idea it was a registered trademark. And now that I know that, I want to find uh, find that old blue mimeograph ink. Um, see if I could do something with that. Anyway, they can take all of those sorts of forms, uh, but the key is they're the things that designate the source of goods. They're what distinguishes MGM from United Artists or uh, Owens Corning from Manville or you know, Play-Doh from Frisbee, I don't know. Um, trademarks fall on a continuum. Uh, you can have a very weak and generic trademark or you can have something that's extremely protectable. Um, the trademark continuum, it, it start, starts at the generic level and it works its way up through different levels of strength. And the stronger the mark is, the greater the protection. At one level, we've got a pure descriptive or generic mark, I should say, like booking.com. Booking relates to booking of hotels. Um, other generic terms are, are cheeseburger or things like that. They are just the broad classification of a type of product. Nobody can outright own cheeseburger. Anybody can sell cheeseburgers, but you can't necessarily own that word. Then you step up a little bit and we've got descriptive trademarks. And this is like American Airlines. It's a, it's a mark that you can use that describes your product. It's not gonna be very protectable, but you can use it to describe your product and maybe prevent somebody else from using the exact same mark. Next up, we've got the suggestive marks, which are a little bit more protectable and they are marks that don't necessarily immediately describe the product, but sort of hint at it, you know, like Netflix. Nobody knows what a Netflix really is, but it hints at delivery of films, flicks over the internet. So that's a suggestive mark and that's very protectable. Move on up to something like Dutch boy. That's the common phrase. It's a word, uh, a series of words, but it's given a new meaning when you call it line of paint Dutch boy, or if you take the planet Saturn and all of a sudden you turn it into a car brand. Those are arbitrary marks because they take common existing words and give them new meanings. And then the very strongest type of trademark anybody can have is something like Xerox or Google, which is a purely coined word. Now, in the scheme of businesses, Businesses like to stay towards the generic and the descriptive type of mark because they take the least amount of effort to establish in the consumer's mind. You know, if you are some sort of, if you're American Airlines, everybody's going to kind of know what you do just from your name. So you don't have to spend a lot of time and effort getting that out there. Whereas if you come up with a Xerox or a Google and somebody says, well, what the hell is that? you're going to have to spend a lot of time and marketing effort just educating your public to, to understand what it is that you're doing under that trademark. But the flip side of that is you get the strongest protection when other people want to start copying you. One little footnote on the uh, trademark strength is that we had a recent uh, dis uh, decision by the Supreme Court in Booking.com where you know the, the general rule is that a generic term cannot be owned as a trademark. However, uh, the Booking.com decision looked at the question and said that in some instances, when you have a generic, when you're using a generic term as a trademark, if there's strong enough recognition of uh, that term as the source of something by a particular entity, then it can function as a trademark. 
the booking.com decision wasn't a decision that says all you have to do is add .com to a name and it becomes a registered, a registrable <laughs> trademark. It's more along the lines of, you know, what level of, you know, distinction can you show to, to acquire rights in a generic term? Um, it's kind of, you know, it's going to play out for a while because there are a lot of companies out there, you know, 1-800-Flowers.com and, you know, mattresses.com and everything like that. It's going to take a while to see how this thing all plays out. But at some level, you can protect these very generic trademarks under the booking.com decision. So when do trademark rights accrue? Um, as soon as you start using a trademark um, in commerce, you begin accruing rights to it. Now, the rights are twofold. You can have common law rights just by using a trademark and not seeking any sort of registration for it. You know, our firm, Henderson Franklin, you've all seen our HF logo. That's not a registered trademark, but the firm has common law rights to that going back as far as they've been using that particular trademark. So any business, once they start using a mark, they can get these common law rights. The rights might be a little bit limited um, because they uh, may only be enforceable in, say, your geography, um, your local area, or with respect to your particular product, but you still have rights in those uh, nonetheless. It might be hard for us to prevent an HF firm in Los Angeles from having a similar logo um, because they're so far away, but we would have rights, you know, certainly here, let's say, in Florida. Now, you can register a trademark with either the federal government or the state of Florida or any state, and you get a little bit stronger uh, package of rights. Um, at the federal level, you, you can register a trademark uh, with the USPTO, and that will give you rights in all 50 states. Of course, the, the hitch there is that you have to show you're using the mark in interstate commerce, which is pretty easy uh, given the, the status of the internet and, and uh, you know, yeah, especially down here in Southwest Florida where we're dealing with so many sunbirds and everybody has customers and clients from all over the U.S., um, you can certainly show interstate use uh, and get a federal registration. That gives you some fairly strong rights, much stronger than the common law. Florida has its own trademark act, as does every other state in the union. Most of them significantly parallel the uh, Lanham Act, which is the federal act in terms of the rights conveyed and the uh, and remedies and everything like that. Um, sometimes it makes sense to register both federal and state. Sometimes it makes sense just to register in the state. It all depends on what the trademark is, what the business is. But registering your trademark gives you a, a, a bit stronger uh, rights than just uh, common law rights. It's not a requirement, but it's certainly, certainly recommended. So a federal registration, you can file that based upon your actual use of the trademark. If you're already in the market, like let's say our HF logo, again, we've been using that for years. So we can file it based upon the fact that we've actually been using it. Um, same thing in the state. The state of Florida, uh, you can file your trademark on you know, you have to disclose when you first started using that trademark. The federal system allows people to, and this is helpful for startup companies, it allows businesses to file trademark applications based upon an intent to use, which just means I want to use this thing in the future. So the trademark office will accept that application and your rights will relate back to the filing date um, but before you actually get a registration, you have to show that you're using it. So a startup company that doesn't know how long it's going to take them to get their product out there, they can file their trademark application and sort of lock up that name uh, so long as they ultimately come to market and establish and show that they're using that trademark. Uh, at the state level, you can't file on that intent to use. You have to actually show actual use of the trademark at the time you file the application. Um, a federal registration can last 10 years and be renewed indefinitely as long as you continue using the trademark. And the state registrations, those last uh, five years and they can be renewed upon continued use. So taking a step back, once you register and everything, what are we protect, what you, you have protection against? Well, 
biggest thing you have protection against is the use of identical or confusingly similar trademarks by others. That's the big thing that prevents consumer confusion. If somebody else's trademark is too similar, then it can be an infringement uh, of your trademark rights, and there may be recourse against that. That's what the whole system is intended to prevent. Here in the 11th Circuit, um, we look at seven different factors to determine whether or not there's a likelihood of confusion between trademarks. Now, I'm not going to talk about each of these, but, you know, it, it's sort of commonsensical in a way. You look at whether the trademarks are too strong or too, uh, too, too similar in terms of sound or appearance. You know, it's Coke, C-O-K-E, and Coke, C-O-Q-U-E. Those things are confusingly similar. So you have to look at the trademarks, you have to look at the goods and a number of other things but it's a seven-part test. At the end of the end of the test, if trademarks are likely to be confused, then the one who was using it first has the priority and uh, has the stronger rights and can pollute someone else. So thinking about that and likelihood of confusion and preventing others from using similar marks, it's important to know that trademarks are self-policed. Nobody else is going to do this for you. If you have a trademark, you have to watch the market and make sure others aren't using it improperly or without permission or if they're not using something that's too similar. Uh, failure to do that can result in an abandonment of your rights, which is exactly what happened with the trademark aspirin, as well as some others, but that's probably the most famous that everybody knows. Trademarks uh, can be uh, trademark uh, trademarks can be uh, enforced through litigation, um, usually in federal court, uh, because of the Lanham Act. Now, under the Lanham Act, you can also bring a claim for an unregistered, i.e., non-federal registered trademark, which means you can theoretically sue on state registration as well as a mark where you don't have a registration. Again, like our HF logo. Usually in any trademark action, you're bringing a number of claims all at once, and they relate to the infringement of the trademark itself, false designation of origin, which just means that, you know, the, that the other party is using a mark that's so confusing, similar to yours that people are, are, are uh, confused as the origin of their product. Uh, then there's common law trademark infringement, just like uh, common law trademark rights. We've got unfair competition, and then, of course, the Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practices Act encompasses trademarks as well. So those are the usual sorts of claims that you would see in trademark litigation. Uh, as far as proofs and everything, there's a whole, you know, litigating trademark claims is another whole one hour plus CLE, you know, can involve experts and surveys and all kinds of evidence, but uh, Suffice it to say, a trademark litigation is a long, hard, expensive slog, um, and so it's best when we're talking with our clients to think about trademark issues and any intellectual property issues at the very beginning. You want somebody forming their company, look at the name. Can you even use it? Do you want to get stuck in a lawsuit in five years because of a name? Uh, trademark uh, litigation uh, remedies, uh, you know, everybody, well, what can you get out of this? Of course, uh, the biggest one that people go for usually is the injunctive relief. We just want them to stop using the name. We want them to rebrand, okay? That's the biggest one. It's always a part of every trademark case, at least every case I've been involved in. What, you know, what other remedies are available? Uh, the disgorgement of profits. Um, the uh, the successful you know a trade the senior trademark owner if the infringe if it proves infringement it can re get a, a an accounting of and it can uh, it can get the defendant's profits what did they make selling that product using my trademark then there's also actual damages um, uh, and uh, attorney's fees under the federal law the attorney's fees are only uh, awarded in sort of uh, exceptional cases. Uh, the Florida Trademark Act makes it clear that the successful litigant is entitled to attorney's fees. So that's why it uh, makes sense to register a trademark not only at the federal level, but also in Florida because you have 
that attorney fee provision. Uh, and then in, uh, you know, in some instances, you can get uh, call, uh, uh, statutory or trouble damages, and that'll deal with, uh, you know, counterfeiting. You know, like we all see the, uh, the Louis Vuitton bags all over Canal Street in New York and other places like that. There are some strong remedies against counterfeiters, which is nice to know for uh, companies that are involved in consumer products. So that's the first main um, food group, as it were. And so I guess I'll, I'll turn things over now to Luca so he can talk about a couple of uh, other uh, aspects of intellectual uh, property. Uh, thank you, Mark. And if you wouldn't mind uh, um, unsharing your screen. I'm getting to it. <laughs> There we go. Okay. So um, uh, in the top right of everyone's screen, you'll see an option called speaker view. If I'd ask you to click on that, it'll kind of maximize the screen so you can see me because we're going to do some, some additional slides here. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that uh, uh, introduction. Thank you to the Lee County Bar Association. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and as Mark said, I'm going to talk to you about two of the, the other quote unquote food groups, uh, and that is copyrights, and patents. So let's dig in. The, um, the first food group that we're going to discuss is copyright law. Copyright law. And as, as Mark alluded to, uh, copyright law is, is a very old form of law. It's enshrined in our Constitution. And the rationale for doing so is to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, uh, with the idea being that if we want to incentivize authors to create works of art, we can create a private property right in that art, uh, allowing authors and artists to profiteer off of their creativity, right? So this is a, a very um, American principle going back to the founding. And the first question we have to ask ourselves is, well, what is protectable, right? What qualifies for protection under copyright law? Uh, there's two basic requirements. So the first requirement is that you have to have an original work of authorship. And the second is that that work has to be fixed in a tangible medium. Okay, so let's, let's unpack this a little. Uh, to be fixed in a tangible medium, we're talking about written down somewhere. Now that could be physically written as in words on a page. Uh, it could be digitally written as in electronically stored information on a computer. Uh, the key is just that the information is recorded in some fashion. Uh, this, the, the other prong, the idea of an original work of authorship, uh, this is something that is uh, a little more complex. So let's take a look. An original work of authorship has a couple requirements, okay? The first of which is that you have to have independent creation. Again, our purpose in copyright law is to incentivize new works, right? So it makes sense that in order to be protectable, it has to be a new work, right? You can't have copied from someone else. The, the second portion of copyright law is that there has to be a minimal degree of creativity. That's what the Supreme Court has said, a minimal degree of creativity. Again, makes a lot of sense in view of the purpose of copyright law. Uh, this comes from the Feist case, which is one of the few cases where a court found that there wasn't enough creativity. Uh, what this case was, is uh, somebody wrote a phone book and they tried to copyright the phone book. And the Supreme Court said, well, an alphabetical listing of names in a particular geography is not very creative, right? There's, there's really no other way to make a phone book. Um, and so when you uh, are, are looking at this in, in the lens of helping your clients, what you do is you say to yourself, okay, did my client create something? And is that something at least minimally creative, as, as low as that bar is, right? Is it at least minimally creative? If, if the answer is yes, then there's potential copyright protection for your client, okay? So let's take a look at maybe some, some examples. As Mark said, we, we all think of things like books, right? We understand that a book could be copyrighted. Um, 
but how about music, right? Whether that's notes or the lyrics to a song, that's definitely something that we can protect. Uh, a speech, right? This presentation is being recorded as we speak. Um, and as, a, as such, it's fixed in a tangible medium. So this speech is something that is protectable under copyright law, right? A painting, uh, brush strokes on a canvas is the same as letters on a page. It's something that could be protectable. Uh, an important point to consider when your clients are working with graphic designers, right? All of that becomes protectable. How about a sculpture? Um, absolutely. You ask yourself, is it a new work? And is it fixed in a tangible medium? Well, I, I'd like to think that marble is pretty tangible, right? Um, what this tells you is not just when you have an artist as a client, do you need to think about these issues? It's whenever your client has physical products, right? Where those products embody some type of creativity. Those products could be protectable. Software is a great example, right? The lines of code in our software are recorded electronically. It's something that could be protected. Uh, another great example, we have here a, uh, a social media post that was put out to advertise this very event. And you start to ask yourself, well, as Mark said, we have a, a logo that may be protectable by trademark law, but is it minimally creative? I don't know. Maybe you could also protect it by copyright law. And that's an overlap that Mark will discuss later. Uh, what about the text? The takeaway here for your clients is ask your clients, who's managing your social media? Who's writing the text? Right? Do you have proper agreements in place to make sure that that text is owned by your client? I can't tell you how many cases I've had where clients hired external marketing firms. They fired the firm and all of a sudden the social media evaporates because the firm takes it with them and says, we own it. Do you have the agreements in place and can you walk your clients through that? Uh, lastly, the photographs. Right? Uh, these photographs were taken not by an employee of Henderson Franklin, but by an independent contractor. Default setting under copyright law is that an independent contractor has the rights in those photographs. Did we have an agreement in place so that we can use them here today in social media? Right? These are questions to ask your clients. Who's taking the photographs? Do you have a contract with them? Etc. cetera. Uh, let's talk a little bit now about the uh, next food group, it's, it's my favorite, patent law. Uh, as uh, was mentioned, I am a patent attorney. Uh, we have uh, Thomas Jefferson here. He's well known as uh, uh, the third president, uh, writer of the Declaration. Something that's not well known is he was our first commissioner of patents, right? Thomas Jefferson. And believe it or not, the language of the Patent Act, much of it actually dates back to the Patent Act of 1790, that Thomas Jefferson wrote. Uh, that presents quite a few challenges for us as patent attorneys because we often take a cutting edge technology and we have to fit it within a statute that was written over 200 years ago, right? Very challenging sometimes. Uh, again, I will tell you that it's part of the same clause, the constitution, it's the patent and copyright clause. Again, the purpose being to incentivize innovation that by creating a private property right for people, we can encourage people to invent more, right? To invent more. Same question as before, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is patentable, right? What is patentable? And this is where we have Thomas Jefferson's lovely language of a process, machine, a manufacture, or a composition of matter. And in a moment, we're gonna unpack what each one of these categories really means. Uh, first though, because it's so broad, I, I can tell you that the Supreme Court has explained that the goal was to capture anything under the sun that is worked by the hand of man, right? Anything under the sun that is worked by the hand of man. Uh, that's broad enough that it, it's probably helpful to look at patentability by asking ourselves, well, what can't be patented? to kind of look at the opposite to understand the general rule. Uh, what can't be patented? So we have a couple different categories the courts have explained. An abstract idea, uh, as Mark said earlier, you can't patent an idea per se, 
You can only patent a particular embodiment of an idea. A purely mental process, you can't patent something that's only in your mind. Math, right? you can't patent math. Unfortunately, there's, there's no monopoly over laws of nature or mathematics. Uh, and atomic weapons, I guess the federal government decided it's probably a bad idea to have uh, documents in the public domain floating around with, you know, step one, get yourself some plutonium, right? Step two, uh, we, don't, we don't want that. Uh, the, the best way to understand this is to remember Einstein's E equals MC squared. You can't patent math, you can't patent atomic weapons, which of course, this is the backbone of that, of that science. Um, it's sort of an abstract idea, right? When you're encountering something like this with a client where they say, you know, I have an idea as such, not something you can patent. Uh, as I said, the patent laws are, in many cases, over 200 years old. So here's a question for the room. What about software? Is software an abstract idea? Right? We said earlier that it's recorded in a, in a medium of some sort, but you can't hold it. Right? It's only a series of instructions, step one, step two, step three. It's mathematical. Can you patent software? Uh, the answer is yes, but it, very carefully. <laughs> uh, this is a big part of my job, especially as an electrical engineer. I did a lot of programming and I've worked with a number of clients to find ways to convince the patent office that their particular app or their particular program is not abstract, that it's somehow qualifying for patent protection. There are three basic requirements to secure a patent. Uh, going back again to the purpose of patent law, we understand that a patent has to be new, right? Our goal is to incentivize new creations. A patent has to be useful. Uh, this is a relatively low bar to meet. Uh, it's useful in the meaning that it helps mankind in some fashion, right? Pretty low standard. Uh, the last one, of course, non-obvious. Uh, I spend most of my time as a patent attorney arguing about what non-obvious means, right? Something that's obvious to me may not be obvious to you. And I think you can get the sense that this is an area for a lot of litigation. It's an area where you have to you know, cautiously work with a client to understand what was old and what's new about their particular invention. But assuming you meet these criteria, you are eligible for a patent. Um, within patents, we have a couple different types, okay? We have design patents, utility patents, and my favorite, plant patents. So a design patent protects the ornamentation of an invention. It's, it's not the usefulness, it's the way something looks, the exterior of a product, for example. A utility patent, by comparison, protects some utilitarian feature of the invention, what it does, right? How it works. That's a utilitarian aspect. That's a utility patent. And a plant patent, as the name suggests, is a new varietal of plant. And you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, you can patent a plant? Absolutely. And we'll see in a moment some, some fun examples. Uh, turning now to the first of these, the design patent, why don't we dil, uh, drill in a little bit to learn more? Uh, these are two examples that I've pulled. Uh, one is the design patent from Steve Jobs for the iPhone, right? the one right below me here. Uh, and then because we're in sunny Southwest Florida, I have a design patent here for uh, Oakley sunglasses, right? In both cases, what we're trying to protect isn't the utilitarian aspect. There have been other phones before. There have been other sunglasses before. What we're asking ourselves is, does our client have a product that has a unique aesthetic to it? Is there something special about the shape, about the way it's formed, it's ergonomic for the hand? Is there something there that we could protect? Uh, a key takeaway for you as attorneys is, when your client has a physical product, ask yourself, is this unique in some way? Just, just from across the room, does it look different? Uh, I can tell you this patent here from Apple, uh, Mark may know the exact number. If I'm recalling, I believe this is what gave Apple its $600 million judgment against Samsung, this patent right here. So sometimes the way a product looks 
can be very important in securing protections for a client. Uh, some other examples, what happens if your client has a product that is not unique enough to get a design patent? Is it possible to maybe protect something else? Say for example, the packaging. Uh, this is a fruit cup that Kraft was able to protect uh, in getting a design patent. Again, there have been many cups before, but the particular look and aesthetic of this cup, they could protect. Uh, I love yogurt in the mornings. This is uh, Chobani. They were able to protect the box that their yogurt comes in. Wait a minute, you can protect a box? Absolutely, right? So thinking with your clients about, well, maybe my client doesn't have a product that I could protect per se, but maybe there's a way I could protect the packaging for that product, right? A point to consider. Uh, one of the most famous examples is Coca-Cola. The uh, way back over a hundred years ago, they had a design patent on the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle. Uh, more recently, we have things like the Xbox controller, right? Not protecting the fact that you have a video game controller, that's been done before, but protecting the way it's packaged. Uh, I wanna give you some other examples that you may not have thought of. Uh, could you patent the Statue of Liberty, right? The answer is it was done. Uh, small Statues of Liberty were sold as a fundraiser to pay for the major statue and a patent was secured. What, what about a skyscraper? So this is Santiago Calatrava. He's my, my favorite architect. Mark knows him. He does a lot of work in Chicago. And this particular skyscraper, the design was patented, meaning that on the skyline, there's only going to be one of those kind of buildings. Uh, how many of you work with uh, design professionals, right? Architects or engineers? Certainly a point to consider. Uh, last part before I move on and design patents. I want to talk to you about patenting something that doesn't exist. And you say, Luca, what are you, what are you talking about? This is the uh, X-Wing fighter from Star Wars. Believe it or not, George Lucas was able to get a patent on the design of a spaceship that doesn't exist. Now, why did he do that? Because he was selling toys that uh, had this physical appearance and he wanted to be able to attack people under the patent laws for infringement of his toy products. So again, thinking to yourself, does my client have maybe a fictional idea that we could protect in some way? A point, again, to consider. Uh, moving on, we have the second grouping of patent rights, which we called utility patents. Again, the goal here is to protect some utilitarian feature of an invention. Uh, I thought because we're doing things by Zoom, I would put this patent up. Uh, this is from the 1930s and is the original patent for television. This is the uh, circuitry. As an electrical engineer, I love this. Um, maybe a more down-to-earth example, again, because we've all been spending time at home, is something like Monopoly. Again, you may ask yourself, well, you can patent a board game? Absolutely. Why not? It's a series of instructions. There is something tangible there. There's a rule book with pieces and dice something that could be protected. Uh, this gentleman who invented this, uh, Mr. Darrow, was actually the world's first patent millionaire. The first person to make over a million dollars on patent royalties was the Monopoly game. Not the telephone or the light bulb, Monopoly. Uh, going back, we have, uh, of course, this idea of manufacture. I, uh, I wanted to highlight this because, as I said, the language is quite archaic. A manufacturer under the statute really just means a tangible product of some kind and a good, if you will, uh, a physical product like chairs. That's an example of a manufacturer. Uh, it could be a game, right? We said that uh, uh, we had looked at Monopoly. This is Twister. This is from the original patent to Twister. Uh, again, possible to protect as an article of manufacture. Uh, lastly, this is a fishing lure. Uh, this is one of my Southwest Florida clients. Uh, I did this patent and the goal was to have a fishing lure where the hooks were on the inside. So the goal was I can cast out, I don't get caught on weeds. When a fish bites it, pulls on the line, the hooks counter rotate outwards inside the fish's mouth and you hook the fish. 
So this is an example of a manufacturer, something that we were actually able to successfully patent uh, on behalf of a client right here in Fort Myers. Uh, I mentioned earlier this idea of design patents, and we also talked about utility patents, but I'm, I'm sure you're beginning to see that there is some overlap here, right? There are some products that you may wanna protect both how it looks as well as how it functions. And that area of overlap is what I like to think of as your, your area of maximum protection. Whenever a product comes to me from a client, I always think, how does it look? Is there something unique about the look? I say, how does it work? Is there something unique about how it works? And I try to find a way to protect both, right? Because by having these overlapping layers of protection, we can maximize the client's rights. Uh, lastly, I'm going to talk to you about plant patents. Um, as I said, a plant has to be invented. It can't just be discovered. That means you can't walk in the woods and find a new species of plant and patent it. You have to be actively growing plants and trying to cultivate a new varietal. There has to be something new, right? We went through that earlier, that newness is a feature of patent law. And for plants, Newness means there's at least one difference between your plant and whatever exists in the environment. Uh, I wanna give you this example. This gentleman is Rudolf Gustav Haas. Uh, I use him because I was born and raised in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, as was Rudolf. He's a nice Wisconsin boy, just like me. And if you're looking at his last name, it may be a little familiar to you, the Haas avocado. Uh, you'd say to yourself, how did a good old boy from Wisconsin end up inventing an avocado. Well, like me, he escaped the frozen north uh, and made his way to sunnier shores, and uh, in his case, California, and created the varietal of the Haas avocado. So the next time you're enjoying your avocado toast, don't forget to thank my hometown, Milwaukee, for one of our greatest sons, Mr. Haas. And uh, with that, I wanna leave you with one, one final thought before I turn it back to Mark. I always tell clients there are three keys to success. There's three keys. The first thing you need is an idea you can protect. And I see that as my job, that's Mark's job, that's what we do day in and day out, help you protect your idea. But it's important to explain to clients and it's important for you as the attorney to understand this, that there are other things you need to be a success. Clients have to have manufacturing. It's not enough to have a patent framed up on the wall. It's not enough to have a copyright registration certificate in a file folder. You need a way to actually make the product, right? And once the product is made, you need a way to distribute and market the product. Uh, in many instances, I've had to talk to clients about declining representation because they may have had a great idea, but never thought about how to market it, had no idea how to make it or sell it. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mark, who's gonna share with you some information about trade secret law. Mark? Okay, thanks, Luca. And um, I guess that answers the, uh, the question of why, uh, uh, um, <laughs> why, why beer goes so well with avocado toast, I don't know. Um, so we're going to talk now about the last uh, piece of, of the trade secret, tra uh, the uh, IP puzzle, and, and that's trade secrets. And um, basically, trade secrets. Here's I put up here the definition that comes right from our Florida statutes, and and it is at its most simple essence, it's something that you know that nobody else knows, and it's valuable because you know it and they don't. Um, really simple. It's I have a secret. Okay. Um, it can be those things that, uh, you know, it, it, again, going back to our title here, it's truly what can give a company its competitive advantage. Um, you know, we've got, of course, uh, you know, some of the more uh, archetypal uh, type trade secrets are the kernels blend of uh, herbs and spices. Uh, the formula for Coca-Cola is another one. Uh, exactly what is in WD-40. Those are all trade secrets and those are the backbone of multi-billion dollar companies. So it, it's just, 
it can be so it is something that gives that entity an advantage uh, trade secret law uh, it's not like patent or copyright it's not something that comes out of the Constitution it's not even something that really comes out of the federal law it's been protected mostly through state law and uh, primarily through the Uniform Trade Secret Act, which uh, 48 states have adopted. Florida has adopted it. And about three, four years ago, the federal government uh, uh, adopted the Federal Defense Trade Secret Act, which relies a lot on state law and was issued or was uh, enacted with the idea of making some uniformity to trade secret law across the US, but it's really sort of muddied things because it relies on all different pieces of state law um, or uh, there, there's you know, conflicts with circuits and things like that. So it's made it a little bit messy, but what it does do is it allows a basis for federal jurisdiction and that you can then have a trade secret case in federal court, whereas before it was purely a matter of state law. Um, uh, what can be protected as trade secrets? You know, we talked about the, the herbs and spices, uh, the formula for Coke, but it can be more than that. It can be production methods, how something is actually made. Um, and then it can be your sales information, uh, your customer list, pricing list, business plans, financial plans, all of these things that go to the heart of what a business does and the heart of what gives that business an advantage over others. Um, you see a lot of trade secret litigation involving ex-employees or ex-consultants or, or contractors because they had it, it, access to that kind of information. So at the beginning, I mentioned that every business has some intellectual property well, certainly every business has, at its very least, you know, customer lists, prospect lists, and plans for how they're going to expand. And those things are trade secrets that can be protected um, and, and kept from, uh, from uh, misappropriation by others. So how do you create a trade secret? Well, the whole key to trade secrets is exactly what you would think is secrecy. And so how do you maintain secrecy? Uh, Coca-Cola famously or allegedly, some people think it's just a stunt, have their formula for Coke inside a vault in an office building in Atlanta. Uh, whether that's true or not, who knows, but that's kind of what you need to do. You need to ensure that things that are secret, are uh, that you limit access to those. Coke goes so far as only certain people know certain parts of the formula and you know part of it is made in one building and then it's shipped to another building where they add something and the other building adds something else so nobody really knows the whole thing just their little their little part um, you have to be protect uh, proactive with protecting the trade secrets that you have you need to do things like uh, put trade secret language and confidentiality terms in employment agreements so that people that you hire understand they're gonna have access to information and they can't do anything with it. Non-disclosure agreements with, uh, with, with contractors or consultants so that if they see how your business works, they can't do anything with that information. Trade secrets, unlike all the other intellectual property we've been talking about, are not registered. And it makes a lot of sense there because, you know, I think Luca mentioned, you know, why you can't have a patent on an atomic bomb. Well, patents require full disclosure of how to uh, embody uh, or how to practice the invention. So you have to have, you know, steps one through 100 of how to make an atomic bomb. And that's your patent. It's all public record in your patent. Well, if you want to register a trade secret, you have to disclose it all. So it's no longer a trade secret. So when you're talking with clients and if somebody comes to you, it's like, hey, I got this great formula for a new soft drink. Well, is it something that you want to maybe try and protect, you know, some way uh, as, you know, like say a, a patentable idea, or is it something that's better protected as a trade secret? You have to, you have to look at that and then decide which way to take it. Um, 
And trade secrets uh, can last for potentially uh, you know, unlimited duration so long as they uh, are maintained as secret. Litigating trade secret cases, again, now we have a basis for federal jurisdiction with the Federal uh, Defend Trade Secret Act, and then there's always going to be the state court actions that you can bring um, uh, you know, uh, separate or independent of any federal action or instead of the federal action. Uh, and your claims are always going to, you know, rely uh, lie in the area of, you know, misappropriation. Someone took something, uh, but then there could be other claims that you have to look at, whether or not, uh, say, an officer left the company and uh, they started a competing company. Well, was there some sort of a breach of fiduciary duty because they were an officer or a director? Uh, was there a non-disclosure agreement? Uh, that could be the basis of a breach of contract claim or an employment agreement. And of course, we've got unfair competition and uh, the Deceptive and Unfair Trade Practices Act. Um, the remedies, um, again, relying heavily on injunctive relief, they make them stop doing that, and then damages. Uh, you know, a plaintiff can be uh, entitled to their actual damages. Again, that'd be like a, a disgorgement of profit almost. Um, and the unjust enrichment, what did the defendant make by using the trade secret? And in some cases, uh, punitive damages. The FIDUPTA and, and the uh, Florida Trade Secret Act uh, have, uh, have uh, double damages for uh, willful and, in, and intentional. Last thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to do it really quickly because I know we're running out of time here, is that um, uh, Luca mentioned it, and I think I mentioned it at the beginning, you know, Trade, uh, intellectual property is, is it, it all meshes together. Different things can cover different aspects of a, of, of a, of a product or a, a, a company or a service or whatever. So you have to look at it and think about what uh, is involved with a certain product uh, and how to best protect it. And again, you know, you look at the Coca-Cola bottle. Luca mentioned the design uh, patent on the uh, bottle design. It's also a protectable trade dress on the trademark side. Of course, we've got the trademark Coca-Cola. There might be patents on the glass or the machinery that bottle it. Um, so whenever uh, you know, you're advising a business and they have an idea for a product, you have to look at it from a number of different angles and think of which is the best way to protect it, because obviously you don't want to uh, you know, disclose secrets or, or use the wrong sort of uh, IP form to protect something. One last thing is that, you know, we're talking mostly about businesses and, you know, products and services and what they're out there in, mar in the market with, you know, their widgets, but there's other areas of just general business and corporate law uh, where intellectual property concerns um, should be, you know, should be on, on your mind as well. You know, again, I mentioned that earlier, start from the beginning. Somebody wants to form a business. Is that name even taken? You know, you can look in SunBiz and all SunBiz cares is that it is, it's not identical to something else. But can your company, your client really call themselves, you know, Disney Naples? I don't know. You know, you have to look at it from whether or not there might be a trademark issue with the name. Um, employment law and uh, is, is another area. You want to make sure that... Uh, you end up owning uh, the works that, uh, that employees and contractors make. Luca talked about the default being the creator of something is the owner of that thing. So you need to make sure that, uh, that there are transfers of ownership in contractor situations. Of course, licensing, you know, whether your client is issuing a license on their IP or if they're signing a software license, what rights are they going to have? you know, to use the software. Uh, IP is a huge part of business transactions and m and In fact, I think Ocean Tomo recently said that, you know, something like 90% of the value of the S&P 500 is intellectual property and other intangible assets. So in any business transaction, IP is always going to be a concern. And of course, there's franchising. If the client gets big enough, how are they going to branch out? And then even uh, I've seen it come up in family law and estate planning situations where husband and wife own a business and they're breaking up. What happens to the name of the business? Who owns what? Um, somebody passes away and they, you know, 
they wrote this song back in 1944 and what's it worth and how do you know all of that so these things can come up in all kinds of different situations and uh, you know I hopefully we gave a little bit of information and enough uh, so that you'll at least know what some of the issues might be when you're talking with uh, business clients about uh, some of these IP issues so with that I think we're just going to say thank you and on behalf of uh, Luca um, you know, thank you for uh, your attention, and hopefully uh, you guys got a little bit out of all of this. So if there's any questions, I guess, you know, whatever time's left, we'll be happy to try and answer them. Thanks. Yes, let's open it up for questions. Uh, I didn't see any um, on the chat. Oftentimes, Mark, uh, we find that people aren't comfortable asking questions on the Zoom platform, but we'll, we'll keep it open for about another 20 seconds. No questions. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, thank you so much to Mark Needs and Luca Hickman. That was a fantastic presentation. We do have a new intellectual property section and it, it started off with a bang. Anybody whose Zoom profile doesn't have their name, please reach out to Lauren Baugh so that we can issue your CLE, which we will do promptly. And uh, you can always ask those, both of these guys questions offline on their um, emails. So thank you again to our speakers. Thank you to our um, people that attended, our attendees, and we look forward to our, our next one in 2021. Everybody stay safe. Thank you. Take right, care. Thanks, Peter.